that's Lauren Miley, and this is Conversation. Conversation. Hello, everyone. Hi. So today we have an absolutely amazing expert Woo-hoo. on for you. She is a professor from the University of South Florida. Go Bulls. Her name <laughs> is Dr. Lori Ferdell. And prior to coming here in 2005, she served as the director of research at the Police Executive Research Forum, PERF, which is in Washington, D.C. She has over 30 years of experience conducting research on law enforcement. Her primary research areas are police use of force and violence against the police. She has authored, co-authored, and edited multiple books and articles on these areas, and she's also a national expert on bias policing. She speaks nationally on this topic and has produced a training program for police agencies. She has authored articles, chapters, and three books on this topic. So with that introduction, welcome Dr. Fredell. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for being here. We are so excited. Okay, so to begin, what got you involved in studying policing and especially bias policing? Well, my history of studying policing goes back to graduate school where I was assigned to a professor who was doing fabulous research on police use of deadly force. And that got me interested not only in policing, but also in use of force. And you know that has uh, carried along with me um, to the present. And then in terms of bias policing, I actually left academia in 1999 to work at a think tank in Washington, D.C., the Police Executive Research Forum. And it's very relevant that I got there in 1999. Because at that point, you know, bias policing is sometimes in the background and sometimes it's in the foreground. And at that point in time, it was in the foreground. It was arguably the number one issue facing law enforcement at the time. That's when we started using the term racial profiling. And there was a lot of discussion about driving while black and driving while brown. Well, since I was at a think tank and we were supposed to focus on the key issues facing law enforcement, we started looking at bias in policing. And so I spent a lot of time, we got grants from US DOJ, thinking about bias policing, learning about it, and creating resources for police agencies. So, so that's great. Seems like you got in there at a, at a perfect time. So today we're going to be discussing your fair and impartial police training in addition to two recent publications. So first, can you tell us about your fair and impartial police training, which is the number one curriculum for implicit bias awareness training for law enforcement? So kind of what is the purpose of this training? So as you said, it's an implicit bias awareness training, and it reflects the fact that we have in recent years learned from social psychologists how to think about bias and prejudice in a different way or actually maybe in a more expanded way. So they've been studying bias and prejudice, these social psychologists, mostly in university settings, since the 1950s. And originally, they only thought bias and prejudice manifested as what we now refer to as explicit bias. Mm -hmm. And an explicit bias means that individuals link groups to various stereotypes. The linkage is based on animus and hostility towards those groups. So that grouping might be based on race, ethnicity, gender, LGBTQ. The stereotype might be lazy, doesn't want to work, and criminal. And those stereotypes impact on that person's perceptions and their behavior producing discriminatory behavior. So think of a racist. Their um, stereotypes are based on animus and hostility. Those perceptions impact their perceptions and behavior. And really important characteristics of explicit bias is that this person with explicit bias knows it, owns Mm -hmm. it, and might even tell you about it. Hmm. I don't like this group because they are A, B, and C. Almost by accident, and it's actually an interesting methodological history, but almost by accident they discovered implicit bias, where we still link individuals to stereotypes, but it's not based on animus and hostility. Those stereotypes can impact on our perceptions and behavior, producing discriminatory behavior. Really importantly, these stereotypes can impact us outside of conscious awareness, even in well-intentioned people, meaning even in individuals who at the conscious level reject biases, stereotypes, and prejudice. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because while I was at PERF, I was thinking about resources for agencies, I knew training was going to be really important, but I didn't know what it would look like until I was introduced to the modern science of bias, recognizing implicit bias. 
So again, what we do is we are going into police departments all over North America, and our training consists, first and foremost, about what is implicit bias, how might it manifest in policing, what are the consequences of bias in policing to mm -hmm. community members, police officers, and the departments, and then really important, what are the skills that the audience needs to produce fair and impartial policing. Mm -hmm. And, and we have curriculum that are targeted towards various subsets of the agency, and the, and the skills units are different. So the skills for patrol officers are a little different than the skills for supervisors and then mid-managers, and then there's a command-level training as well. Fantastic. So how prevalent do you think that these implicit biases are? Everybody has implicit bias. Okay, that was kind of <laughs> that was kind of what I was thinking. Taylor and I have actually talked about this mm -hmm. a little bit, and we both kind of discussed that, like, we, you know, we have our own implicit biases mm -hmm. that we are aware of, but that that's really what's important. Like, if you're aware of it, then you can make changes. And that is exactly right, because there's a whole lot of literature, not just on implicit biases, but de-biasing techniques. Mm. And it starts with an understanding of implicit bias, which in well-intentioned people produces the motivation to adopt the skills. Yeah, we for our listeners who listen to our Ferguson, Missouri episode mm -hmm. and our episode with Dr. Mole, that's kind of where we started talking about implicit bias. And so now we're continuing that conversation for our listeners who enjoyed that episode. Yeah. So it seems that the training and how you got started training these agencies maybe came from your experiences at PERF? Yes, and so that's when the light bulb went off. Mm. I had first learned about implicit bias. But most of the activity in producing the curriculum um, came when I got to USF. And at that point, I partnered with a really creative and well-experienced curriculum designer. And then we applied for grants from USDOJ. And we have, over time, brought in over $1.5 million to the university both to produce the curricula as well as to disseminate it. Wow. That's Very awesome. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I feel like this is a curriculum that, like, everyone would need. Mm -hmm. It would be a pretty cool, like, undergraduate class, like, just to teach people about these biases and mm -hmm. how that they work. I I've had the opportunity to train USF student advisors in implicit bias. Oh, wow. That's great. As yeah. well as the med students. And so you're oh, right. It wow. is applicable to any population. Absolutely. How was your experience with the medical community? Well, it was very interesting, and they were very sharp. And when I go into a group that I'm not as familiar with what they do as I am with policing, I give them the principles, and I have them apply it. And they huh. did a very good job of figuring out what are the types of decisions that they make mm -hmm. that might be impacted by their implicit biases, and also what the associations might be. So mm -hmm. in policing, we talk particularly about the linkage that many of us have between people of color and crime and aggressiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in medicine, it's going to be a different association between a group and a characteristic. Interesting. It's funny because Taylor and I actually went to a colloquium oh, yeah. over at FMHI. Mm -hmm. And the woman that was talking, she actually brought up the fact that she was in the hospital with her husband. Yes. And oh, yes, about the opium he, epidemic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were talking about the opium epidemic. And he, the husband needed opium. And the like, I think nurse it was like back or, pain or something. Yeah. yeah. So they were kind of debating, do we mm -hmm. give this guy... And the you know, nurse oxycontin. came in and she said, well, you guys seem like really nice people, so it's going to be okay. Like, it's okay to give this to you. Well, that leads to a couple of stories. You know, one, <laughs> wow. before, before I met with the med students, um, I looked at some of the research on doctors, nurses, and implicit biases. And the research indicates that implicit biases impact on diagnoses hmm. and mm -hmm. also on prescriptions, including painkillers. Ah, yeah. And then your comment about you look okay. So I was going to do a training in a major U.S. agency that shall not be named. And it was at the dispatch center, and I had to go into this very secure environment. I went through one door into a second door. And at the second door, you walk up to the reception, and there's a huge sign that says, must show ID. So I'm reaching for my wallet, pulling out the ID, and he goes, oh, no problem. You look okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I assure you the chief was not pleased with oh. this story. So whenever you go into these police agencies to train them, what type of reaction do you typically get from them on this topic? That's a great question, Lauren. And when we walk into a training room, and let's say we've got 30 sergeants who've been on the job for 15 or 20 years, 
and they know they're going to fair and impartial policing training. I want you to picture what that audience looks like. They are generally somewhere between defensive and outright hostile. They might be glaring at the trainers, they might have their arms folded, and it's, it's actually very understandable. Um, it, it reflects the way we've talked about bias in policing. We've basically accused officers as if they all have explicit bias. Mm -hmm. And they know that's not the case. I mean, we know that there's explicit bias in all professions, but they've been treated as if they have prejudice and, and prior trainings have treated them like that. So we have to work really hard, and I have 18 trainers. All of them are sworn except for me. And the first part of the curriculum is to break down that defensiveness. Hmm. So we start talking to them about bias. And it's not police bias, it's human bias. Mm -hmm. And how that human bias can play tricks on them and make them ineffective, unsafe, and unjust. So really early on, we're trying to bring that down, that defensiveness, and then also link it to their goals. You wanna mm -hmm. be effective, you wanna be safe, mm -hmm. you wanna be just, listen up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure linking it to just human nature versus saying you are a police officer, you are biased, I'm sure that kind of makes them realize the type of training that they're receiving versus, mm -hmm. ugh, I have more people walking in here to tell me that I'm biased, but I'm sure they realize very quickly this is different, this is going to be mm -hmm. more about just humanistic versus. And no one's shaking their finger at yeah. me telling mm -hmm. me that I'm bad. I'm mm -hmm. sure that's very helpful right off the bat for them especially if they're sergeants and very highly ranked. Yeah. I think, don't you have a story about someone writing you a letter afterwards? Is that right? I kind of remember you in okay. class telling us like a really great story about. And, and I have two of those, and so I'll, I'll see if I remember which one you heard. Okay. Um, but <laughs> one, of the, one of my favorite stories of the reducing the defensiveness, we were going to North Carolina, and prior to our coming to town, this sergeant had been through what I call traditional racial profiling training where somebody stands in the front of the room, wags the finger at them, and treats them all as if they have explicit biases. Mm. Then he gets an email, and it says, not only are you going to fair and impartial policing training, but you're going to the train the trainer session, because now you're going to have to turn around and train the rest of the agency. Oh, wow. So we got a great email afterwards, and it said, you know, I wanted nothing to do with fair and impartial policing or its philosophy, but as luck would have it, I was handpicked to t attend the train the trainer session. And even though I tried every possible excuse to get out of the training, I had to go. And I showed up Monday morning as defensive and angry as I could possibly be. And it took about two hours. And then I realized, wow, this is incredibly valuable. And why didn't I have this many years ago? Hmm. That's so awesome. And that's a great testament to the training that you're providing. Makes us feel good when we get oh, messages yeah. like that. Absolutely. Wow. So in your um, explaining the disparity across studies, ex assessing racial disparities in police use of force, a research note, this was in 2017, you highlighted the mixed findings of seven different studies that were published in the spring and summer of 2016. So can you um, kind of elaborate on this study? Yeah, so this brings together my interest in both use of force as well as racial bias. And in 2016, the studies that came out, and there were four of them, the headlines could be summarized as follows. One said, yes, bias. Second one said, no bias. And then there was the sometimes bias. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm sure that, you know, Community members in particular were very confused about this, and also this, of course, leads to cherry-picking the results that they like. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I was going to write a research note looking at why it is that we could get this disparity um, in findings when we're looking at disparity in police use of force. And in fact, when we look at the literature on use of force, um, it goes back to about the 1960s. And even the very earliest studies were looking at the impact of race. You know, are there racial disparities in terms of police use of force? And they found that blacks were overrepresented in terms of being on the receiving end of police use of force. But way back then, if you look at our research methods in criminology and criminal justice, they were very simplistic. Mm -hmm. It was basically comparing the percentage of blacks amongst the people who received force um, to the population. Well, that shows disparity, but it certainly does not produce does not produce evidence of bias, because bias could be producing that disparity, or there could be other legitimate factors that produce disparity in use of force. For instance, differential criminal involvement, or even differences in resistance behavior. 
So studies have become much more sophisticated over time. Certainly we have much more advanced statistics, so we can look at multiple variables at the same time. Although I will say that even though our statistics are much advanced, it's still very challenging to access the relevant data to measure key variables. So in this um, note, I looked at what are the variations across the studies that might produce different results. So for, I, for instance, I looked at how each study measured force. Did they just mm -hmm. look at deadly force? And even deadly force breaks down into deadly force, which produces a death, a wounding, or a miss. And over the years, those have produced very different findings. I also looked at whether the researchers looked just at force incidents or, and this can be more effective as you can imagine, they were able to compare force incidents to incidents where force was not used. Because that mm -hmm. allows us to look at the various characteristics of the incidents that did or did not produce use of force and then see what characteristics um, vary across those two categories, including does race vary across those two categories. Mm -hmm. Of course, another factor when we're looking at research is the number of agencies that were studied. And as you both probably know, we do not have valid, reliable national measures of mm -hmm. police use of force. We actually finally have valid and reliable measures of police use of force that results in the suspect's death. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, that was not produced by criminologists or the government. It was produced by the Washington Post. Um, but there we have to look at, so it's very hard for um, researchers to get data from multiple agencies that is consistent. Mm -hmm. And so the number of agencies can impact on the results. And then another very important factor that varies across the studies are the control variables. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at what are the factors related to a, a situation that might, you know, produce differences across race, you have to control for level of resistance. Mm -hmm. This is the legally justified variable that should produce force. And so it's very important if we're comparing use of force across races to control for the level of resistance. And amazingly, many, many researchers, even modern researchers, do not control for that variable. Mm -hmm. Or one thing you two will find interesting is there's one researcher who said he controlled for the variable and I spent hours looking at the data, looking at how he coded the data, and it turns out his measure for controlling resistance was a bunch of baloney, if I may say it that way. Wow. So you gotta look very closely at studies to figure out what did they do and how did they measure things. Hmm. And then one of the last things that I commented on when I was looking at variations across these articles is how they interpreted their findings. So. This leads us to look at not just how bias might manifest in use of force, but how bias might manifest in how researchers report their results. Because you can certainly spin your results to match your you know, desired narrative or ideology. Mm -hmm. And as one example, one set of researchers highlighted this. Five out of 12 departments showed evidence of bias. And they made a big deal of that. Well, if you think about it, that means seven of the 12 departments mm -hmm. did not evidence bias. Now, mm -hmm. both of those findings are important, but again, it goes to how researchers, how they emphasize the various findings and how they couch them mm -hmm. in their article. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating article. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And actually, I, so I just finished my thesis, and I look at bi bias versus discrimination. And Dr. Burris, actually, because you know, when you're writing up your thesis, you're like, oh, yes, there's proof of bias, proof of bias. And then even... Just Dr. Burris said to me, Taylor, you need to just, you know, separate. Was there just discrimination? Was there just disparities? You know what I mean? You mm -hmm. really need to identify the two. And I mean, I just had never, not that I never thought about it, but like when you're typing up your narrative, you're just like going and you're like, oh yeah, there's differences between white and black youth. And then he kind of had to sit me aside and say, okay, let's define what actual bias is versus, you know, just Despair. a disparity. Yes. So. And I was actually invited, I was very pleased to go to a investigative journalist conference a couple of months ago hmm. because these are the people that go out and they collect statistics from agencies regarding mm -hmm. police activities and whether there is disparity, uh, racial disparity. And too often, they link disparity with bias. Mm -hmm. I yeah. had a big sign made. It was two feet by three feet, and it said, disparity is not equal to bias. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I also have to, to explain this when I go out. When we do the command level training, my favorite version is command and community members in the room. Mm -hmm. And we talk about measurement. And this is also an important message to that group. Disparity is not the same as bias. Because disparity can be made up of multiple parts. Mm -hmm. It certainly could be made up in part of bias. But then as we just discussed with the use of force, it could be based on other very legitimate factors mm -hmm. that produce disparity across races. Mm -hmm. So in addition to that article, you also have recently published an article with Dr. Lim assessing the racial aspects of police force using the implicit and counter bias perspectives in 2016. And in this study, you examined 1,846 use of force incidents in order to determine whether the racial aspects of force are consistent with the implicit bias or counter bias perspectives. So to begin, can you please begin to our listeners, especially some of them who do not follow police implicit bias, um, what the implicit implicit bias or the counter bias perspectives are? So the implicit bias perspective goes back to what we were saying earlier about implicit bias. We link groups to various stereotypes. One very pervasive implicit association or implicit bias is the link between blacks and aggression and crime. And so when they do laboratory studies, they will um, pop up pictures of individuals that are white or black, armed or not armed, and the person is supposed to hit the shoot key, for instance, if the person is armed, and the not shoot key if they're not. Mm -hmm. But as you can imagine, the researchers are trying to figure out whether the race of the person impacts perceptions of threat when you have to move quickly. And the implicit bias research in the laboratory um, indicates that most of us would be more inclined to shoot the black than the white, even under um, when the person is not carrying a weapon. So the implicit bias perspective would predict greater use of force against blacks. And again, as you pointed out, we did this with actual use of force incidents um, in a particular city. Now, it's interesting. Um, another set of studies came out um, the last couple years looking at counter bias. And again, they did laboratory studies, and they used police as subjects to see if the race of the person would impact on those quick-moving scenarios regarding use of force. And in those studies, they found that police were less likely to use force against blacks compared to, for instance, Caucasians. And they described that as possibly being due to officers' concerns about the consequences of using force against blacks. You know, especially in this era following Ferguson, you know, those officers know you use force against the black, you could be on the cover of USA Today, you could be on the NBC Nightly News. And so these researchers thought there could be something that's coming out of, for instance, Ferguson that leads police to use less force against blacks than Caucasians. And so that's what we wanted to compare. We wanted to use actual use of force incidents to see if there was evidence of implicit bias, which, have been, which would have been greater use of force against blacks after controlling for relevant factors, or maybe it leads to lesser force due to the counter bias hypothesis. Very interesting. And just personally wondering, have you found that the counter bias is kind of a valid argument against implicit bias? Because I'm just in the news mm -hmm. when as soon as you see a uh, shooting and they're discussing this, depending on which news source, sometimes they say, well, you know, when does it end? You know, what if they're not protecting themselves because they're scared of shooting, you know, let's say an unarmed black man and they're worried about the repercussions? Have you found this really a valid argument to implicit bias? Well, certainly these studies are really important for us to pay attention to. I, I will say that it would, all of them have been conducted with one agency um, in a certain region then, of course. And so we don't yet know whether they're generalizable. But we actually talk about counter bias in our training. And it comes under the heading of skills, where we're giving them skills to reduce and manage their biases. And this comes under the heading of managing biases. And we're, we call it over-control. Mm -hmm. So you could manage your biases. You can, and it's hard to do in quick-moving situations. Mm -hmm. But if you recognize your implicit associations and you're motivated, you can choose to implement bias-free behavior. And so what these studies say to us is this could be a, a situation where officers are over-managing or over-control. Mm -hmm. And it also highlights for all of us the type of situation we put officers in, right? Mm -hmm. They have to make these decisions in quick-moving situations. If they go too far, they're going to be in court um, because they, you know, use too much force or they, you know, um, use too much force against a particular um, race and therefore they're getting sued. 
or they could be dead, right, mm-hmm. because they used underforce. And so this is a real challenge for officers. But we place this counter-bias hypothesis under the heading of managing biases and tell officers, don't go too far. Mm-hmm. Don't go too far because you're going to put yourself in danger. And what motivated you to look into this and to conduct this study? Well, certainly we were motivated by the fact that there were two competing theories. Um, So that obviously leads a researcher to want to find out, well, which one gets the support in the research? But the other thing that was important, because much of the research on implicit bias by necessity, has been in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. And we know that laboratory studies have the advantage of being able to control for all aspects of the subject's experience and therefore isolate causal factors. But the implicit bias research, um, laboratory research, is replete with requests that we see if field data is consistent Mm -hmm. with um, laboratory data. And that's what we were doing here. We wanted to see if field data were consistent with the implicit bias hypothesis or the counter bias hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And as you graduate students well know, this was not a critical test of those theories, Mm -hmm. but really just as I said, is is, is our data in the field consistent with this hypothesis or the other? Mm -hmm. Clearly other research needs to be conducted. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so this study, you say that you advance our understanding of both the forces, so implicit bias and counter bias perspective. Do you want to explain to our listeners the main findings and the implications of this? Yes, and so we found support for the implicit bias hypothesis and not for the counter bias hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't overwhelming. I think we had like, you know, 16 different assessments and a majority of them showed implicit bias, but not 100%. Mm -hmm. So that's also the reason we need um, future research. But the implicit bias perspective got the support. Interesting. Mm. And where do you personally see implicit and counter bias research heading in this in the future? So you say that we do need more research. Do you see it just replicating these studies, or where do you see it headed? Well, as I mentioned before, um, there's, there's quite a bit of research looking at the extent to which all of us link people of color to crime and aggression. Mm-hmm. We actually, you know, for the purposes of my training and for criminal justice, I want to know what are some of the other groups we link to crime or not crime. Mm-hmm. You know, you and I could conjecture. I would say that the groups we link to non crime would be the elderly, the professionally dressed, Caucasians, women, but we don't really have empirical studies on Mm -hmm. all of those factors. The other thing we need to keep looking at, as I mentioned, there's a whole um, volume of literature on implicit biases, what they are, what groups are stereotyped, and then there's a whole literature on de-biasing techniques, Mm -hmm. the various things that any of us can do to reduce and manage our biases, and so that's an ongoing area of research. And then really important to me personally, what is the, um, we need to evaluate the impact of implicit bias awareness training. Mm-hmm. And that's actually being done for our fair and impartial policing program in the context of our work with NYPD. Mm. Um, we are very proud that we were selected to train directly 35,000 sworn personnel in NYPD. Wow. And in the context of that uh, implementation, two of the top researchers in criminology are doing a controlled study. Um, so that we can see what is the impact of implicit bias awareness training on various outcomes. And so that's very important that we do that. Yes. Wow. I was not aware that that was taking place. That's fantastic. It is. We're very pleased. Wow. Okay. And something that Laura and I like to do on this show, we like to do something called myth busting. We've started it and we just... I think it's one of my favorite parts when we have experts in, um, especially something, I mean, we just had another shooting in the news. Um, what's some myths that you would personally like to bust? Well, one myth is that blacks are shot by police more than Caucasians. Mm-hmm. And this actually goes back to our discussion before when we talk about disparity, because mm-hmm. it's absolutely the case that blacks are shot disproportionate to the representation in the population. Mm -hmm. And so I'm certainly not trying to downplay um, our concern with that disparity. But I've gone into community trainings, and um, they find out that blacks are shot less than Caucasians, and their jaws drop because they think it's more. So as I mentioned before, the Washington Post has been collecting data. Now, keep in mind, these are... um, officer-involved shootings that produced deaths. Mm. So it's a subset of use of force. Mm. But they have data from uh, the last four years. There's generally about 1,000 officer-involved shootings that produced death in the United States. And whites are shot twice as often 
mm. as, as blacks. Mm -hmm. um, again, that does not reduce our interest in looking at the disparity, but in fact, if you look at the actual numbers, um, whites are shot much more than black. Interesting. And so for our listeners, we will be posting the links to those Washington Post articles so you guys can follow mm -hmm. along because um, that's fascinating. I mean, that's something I personally didn't know and I try to follow these as much as I can. So that's, that's right. very interesting. It's a very prevalent myth. Great myth to bust. So thank you so much for coming in, Dr. Fidel. This was an awesome, awesome podcast. Thank you for all the great information. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.